just never know, right? You're sitting on a mountain and then pff, something happens. You're walking to the store and something like that happens, you know? And it's about being open, isn't it? About being willing, about being present. The mystic Thomas Merton's famous prayer begins, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I know myself. And Anne Lamont's version of this prayer, Dear Some Something, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm getting more lost and afraid and clenched. Help. Help. A one-word prayer. Help. So we're starting a mini prayer series today, three, three weeks. And I know that many of you know or are familiar with or have heard before of that there's a five-step unity prayer process that Charles Fillmore initiated, or maybe you know the Science of Mind um, prayer guide for prayer practitioners, or if you've taken my prayer classes, you have a little yellow card with the anatomy of affirmative prayer. And at some point during this series, we'll go there, but today we're going to draw from the simplicity of Anne Lamont's ideas about prayer. She has a little handbook. She said it's the three, thing, the three prayers you need. It's all you ever need. Help. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> Pretty much wraps it up, doesn't it? <laughs> and often we don't talk about how potent that power is, that prayer is, help, that simple prayer, right? So I've been at the Unity Convention this week, which has been amazing. In fact, it's my very favorite one ever. Um, and it was really, really powerful. John's shaking his head. John Rexroth was was with me there. And... Um, I was so proud because John is, I don't know if you all know, but not only is he our bookkeeper here at Unity of Walnut Creek, but he is on the committee for um, budget and finance for all of Unity Worldwide Ministries and has served in that way for a very long time and recently was asked to be the chair of the new benefits team. So, yeah. <laughs> So he's getting quite well known in our movement. Um, and this is the People's Convention, by the way. So it's something that's open to everyone every year in June. And it's really a beautiful gathering. It gives you an opportunity to get to Mecca, which, you know, is, of course, is Unity Village headquarters. And uh, sometime we'll take a, a group there, too, um, on our own. So anyway, I digress. But I want to tell you a little bit about this powerful prayer, this one-word prayer, help, and the power of asking for help. So, um, so it's interesting some of the things that happen, you know, in a very, um, in the ways that you don't expect, right? So one of the highlights from my convention will sound very strange as I begin to unfold it. So I walk into the bathroom one day and I hear somebody on the other side of the stall talking to housekeeping and she sounds like she's got a little distress in her voice and she's saying, well, I'm trying to call my friend and I can't get out of the stall right now. Um, but I will free it up as soon as I can and as soon as my friend can, can come help or whatever it was. And so I, I said, um, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know if it was somebody from the conference or not. It doesn't matter. And I just said, um, hey, do you need help with something? And she said, um, there was this pause. And then she said, yes, I do, actually. She said, I said, well, I'm here. I'm part of Unity's group, you know, not, just to create some familiarity, you know. And uh, she said, okay, come on in. She opens the door to the stall. And it turns out she'd been at the end of a stum terrible stomach flu, and she thought it was over. And she had soiled all of her clothing, and she had white pants on. And so she was stuck. You know, how is she going to walk through the lobby and all this, you know, with these soiled clothes back on? So she just, all she needed was somebody to take her room key, follow her directions, go up and get the new clothes that she needed, and bring them down. Simple, Right? And so, I, you know, she, that, that prayer, because it was a prayer, even though we might not think we're actually praying, our thoughts are prayers, right? And we're thinking, boy, do I need a fresh set of clothes, <laughs> right? And that, even that can be a prayer 
a kind of asking for help, right? A kind of offering to the universe what it is that we need. When we have the courage to ask for help, it opens us up to relationship. It strengthens our relationship with spirit and it strengthens our relationship with each other in ways we have not yet seen because the answers don't get revealed to us often immediately. Sometimes they do, but sometimes it's, it takes a little time, right? For those answers to come back to us with this simple idea of asking for help. And how hard that is for so many of us. How many struggle to ask for help? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of you including me. <laughs> but I, I'm getting better at it because I realize what there is in all of that, that gifts that are in that, the gifts that, that connect us, that build relationship one to another, what it is, whether it is with each other, the human family, or our plant and animal kingdom, or the essence of spirit that runs through it all. It, it's all strengthening by this simple request for help. You'd never know it right? You'd never realize what strength and courage are in there, what gift can be given to the helper as well. And help often comes in these earthly ways, right? So here I am telling you about this experience. It's like it doesn't get any more like lowly human experience, right? Than the sort of a bodily release. And there's more to that prayer that, or this process that I'm going to tell you in a few minutes. But first, I'm just thinking about um, how we often have these expectations when we pray that the answer is going to come in some amazing way, like the song that came through to you. Sometimes it does, right? But I think more often than not, we expect that the answer is going to show up like lightning or, you know, the voice of Charlton Heston is going to like boom somewhere. You know? <laughs> Or, or that somehow it's going to be, you know, maybe in our own version, like all of our chakras will light up, right? Or we'll start to see auras all of a sudden or whatever it is that, that we think is, is sort of that higher plane, that transcendental answer that tells us, oh, it is, is the holy, it is the God, Godness that is answering me. And yet the holy shows up in so many mundane, everyday ways, right? The, the miraculous is actually simple, right? It's everyday miracles. And that's what really grounds our prayers when we recognize that. Grounds it in the everyday humanness. Therefore, we can begin to see the miraculous everywhere present when we recognize that. That our humanity is also divine. That our earthly experience is just as much a heavenly experience. And prayer is the link the linchpin between the two. Prayer is the way that we begin to see that when we give ourselves over, when we ask for help, something so simple. So there was an old story, you've probably heard it before, of a guy that there's a, a flood going on in the neighborhood. And so he goes over on the top of his roof and um, and somebody, uh, neighbors come by and they're in a canoe and, they, you know, the water's getting pretty high. And they say, hey, get in the canoe. We'll save you. And, he, and he's a very religious man. He says, oh, no, I've said my prayers. God is coming to save me. And then along comes a motorboat with some more people, right? You know where this is headed. And they say, you know, get in the boat. We'll save you. And he said, oh, no, no. I, you know, the water's getting higher now. No, no, I've, I've prayed to God and God's going to come save me. Pretty soon he's at the peak of the roof, you know, getting close to the chimney. When a helicopter comes and unfurls a rope and they say, grab a hold of the rope. We'll pull you in. We'll save you. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I've prayed. God's going to save me. Of course, he drowns. And he goes to heaven and he says to God, you know, I prayed and you didn't, what happened? You didn't help me. And God said, what do you want? I sent you a canoe. I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a helicopter. <laughs> but it's just so often that we don't, don't always look, look in that way, in that direction. See in the very simple exchanges, the richness, the beauty, the answered prayer that is there for us. You know, it's like missing the boat is, is missing the holy in the every moment. My mom has a, um, she's really long on common sense and conventional wisdom. And sometimes I'm just like, you know, looking for the deeper, deeper, deeper meaning in things. And I'm talking about something. I'm really thinking I got something here. I'm looking for the metaphor or the metaphysics of it all. And my mom will just say something really like in plain English. And it'll be like the hallelujah, you know, chorus of angels are singing. I'll be like, oh, right. That's really profound. But it's really super, like Captain Obvious, right? <laughs> 
And so it's in that sometimes that there is, if we can just sort of let go of kind of the spiritual path can kind of get us tangled up a little bit. You know what I mean? It's in this sort of complicated expectation. And so instead we can just sort of come, come open, come empty, come humble by just asking and receiving and allowing and paying attention to what comes in response. So the prayer of help has really two parts to it. One is the asking, and the other is the surrendering. In Matthew 7, 7, the scripture says, Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. And so it is simply that, you know, in the asking and then the giving over. I realized yesterday, just yesterday, as I was preparing this talk, how much my prayers have help in them. I wouldn't have known that until I started paying attention. I was like, I'm always asking for help. I'm always asking for the right words. I'm always asking for the right decisions. I'm, I'm calling the unseen helpers to be with me, to walk with me, to bring wisdom. You know, it's, it's really kind of like a constant prayer of help. And I'm thinking maybe your prayers have more help in them than, than perhaps you realize as well. And so that this is, it does seem like it brings us back to this really kind of simple foundation. I'm so grateful for this little guide that Anne Lamott has put out in this, in this, in the simplicity and the beauty and the groundedness of this idea of asking for help. So one of the keynotes at the convention was Maggie Cook Garcia. Her story is amazing. The theme this year was many or one humanity, many stories. And if I knew your story was the subtext. I couldn't help but love you. And that's so true, you know, when we know somebody's stories, how easy it is for us to pass quick judgment. But if we really knew that person's story, we couldn't help but love them. And so it's just this, so a lot of the keynotes, of course, had, you know, rich story in them. And Maggie uh, Cook Garcia's story was, is so rich that she just had to kind of skip over big chunks. So I don't have her story in full, but... Um, there, she had just come back from Hollywood, and they're making a movie about her story, and there was so much in it, they're also making a mini-series. But she grew up in an orphanage in Mexico, and um, the conditions were so bad, the abuse so rampant, she didn't get into it, but obviously it was terrible. And, there were, and she um, said there were times when the kids didn't eat for two to three weeks at a time. So she and her brothers would hunt in the surrounding forest to you know, and come up with any kind of materials they could to, to catch animals and other things that, that they would be able to eat so they could survive. Um, and at one point, she started playing basketball, and she got really good. And so she had this, this what looked like it was going to be a really lucky break. The um, Mexican nationals were going to recruit her to be part of this pro basketball team. And just before that, her brothers had gotten their first American football and they were playing football, and she joined them, and in that process, she broke her collarbone. So somebody, one of the adults that was at the orphanage or in the area, grabbed her by the shoulders, and they said, all of your dreams have just died. And she said, not only did it hurt physically, the way he was holding my shoulders, but of course, it hurt emotionally. But it did not stop her. She continued to ask for help, whether she was actually aware of asking for help in her prayers or not. There was a, a kind of openness to possibility that, that kept opening the door for her, seeking, and then we will find, right? So somehow she ended up in the U.S., and she was playing basketball with some other kids. Some of the kids ended up over in the U.S., and it wasn't clear how they got here or how long they were here. But uh, a person who was connected with a university in Virginia saw her playing basketball and said, I want her on my team and I'll give her a full scholarship. So she got to go to, to university and she studied interior design. She graduated, couldn't find a job and became homeless and lived in the forest. Then somebody found her <laughs> and offered for her a place to stay and she was really good at making um, salsa. And so she started selling it to her friends, she started giving it to her friends, and they, it was so good that people started buying it. So she started selling it to her friends to make a little money. And then she got a divine idea that she could start making fresh salsa and giving it to supermarkets 
because everybody was cooking their salsa back then. You know, all the, all the salsa that you would see on the supermarket shelves was cooked. She said, why not fresh salsa? So she started um, calling. She made a list of 100 different supermarkets. And she said she wrote their answers next, right next to it as she called each one. And so she had 99 no's. And the last one she called was Whole Foods Market. And she didn't get anyone. She left a message. And so she was in her car. I'm not clear if she was living in her car at that point or what. But the next day, she gets a call. She couldn't believe it. It was Whole Foods. And they said, we're interested in learning more. How can, how can we hear more? And she said, when's your next meeting? They said, 9 a.m. tomorrow. She had a drive in, and she said, great, I'll be there. Except the only way she'd get there was to drive all the way through the night because she was that far away. So she said, I didn't care if I was tired. I came with my samples. She said, I walked in. The whole room was men. She was really, you know, intimidated, and she just gave her products, and she just waited, and she said they were just talking amongst themselves, and she couldn't hear them. So she's just waiting very uncomfortably. It reminds me of that movie Shark Tank, or that TV show Shark Tank. <laughs> you know? And then they look up and they said, your products are absolutely delicious. We'll take them. We'll take 10,000 pounds. <laughs> she was so excited. She went back and then she realized she didn't have any money. And you need money to buy tomatoes and onions and everything else you need for a fresh salsa, right? So she had an idea. So she asked her friends, if you would loan, if you would loan me the money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Whole Foods and see if they'll pay me in a week and I'll pay you back in a week. So she got $20,000 from her friends, and Whole Foods paid her in a week $40,000. And so she would keep reinvesting in the business in this way. Eventually, fresh salsa became the thing, right? In all the supermarkets, Sam's Club, uh, Walmart, she was the one who was the first one in all those places. So she went from orphan to millionaire very quickly. Uh, she sold her company to Campbell's, and now she's doing um, some really beautiful work, like rescuing children from drug cartels in Mexico that are in orphanages. And I mean, this woman is a tough, tough cookie. <laughs> but one of the stories she told really stood out for me. And it was that the process of getting that first shipment to Whole Foods of the 10,000 pounds of salsa. So she made all the salsa, got all the help to make it. And then it was like, how am I going to get it there? So she needed a truck to get it there. And so she was... Um, she came up with this real old, she found this old jalopy that she could afford. And so the, the side view mirror was duct taped to the side of the truck, you know, that when she rode the, the seat went, you know, and there was all kinds of funky things like that in the truck, right? And so she said she, when she tested it, it was a standard, when she tested it, she drove it on level ground, but this was West Virginia. So once she got going and she needed to go make the shipment, she was going up hills like this. And so up these hills she's going and back she's sliding, right? <laughs> and so um, she said the other difficult thing about all of this was that not only was it hard to be shifting and, and keep going forward, but she's so short she couldn't reach the pedals. So she had to pull herself as hard as she could and hold herself on the steering wheel just to reach the pedal and then try to quickly move over and shift and get back to the steering wheel. So you can imagine, I mean, I've had not that exact experience, but if you've ever had an experience of not really knowing how to drive stick shift, I've had that experience before. <laughs> and it is really scary, like rolling back and thinking you're going to hit the person behind you and so on. So she finally makes it up this, this hill and she pulls over just to kind of catch her breath, right? And she's got a long way to go yet to make it to Whole Foods. And, and so she's like just taking a pause and looking around and there is that, you know, seek and ye shall find, right? So she's looking around and suddenly some something shows up, a block of wood. And then she remembers she has a, so a roll of duct tape. And so she duct tapes the block of wood to her foot so she can reach the pedal. <laughs> and then on the way, the gas line breaks. And so it's it's dripping gas, and so she has to stop every so uh, you know, every 45 minutes, I guess it was, and get gas. And so then she said she's she has to go to the trucker side. So every time she's she gets out, she's doing this. <laughs> How's it going? You know, she said she got used to it, just got over it. You know, 
But it's that, it's that you know, in, in those times, if you think about the, just one woman's life, you know, all these experiences that she's had of needing help, of desperately needing help, and just that ability to turn it over, to be resourceful, to allow ourselves to connect with the divine mind and divine ideas come. Whatever it is that we might need can show up for us in the seeking, in the willingness, in the asking, in the knocking on the door. And so whether we knock on the door of our neighbors or we knock on the heart of, of God right here or we knock into the allness of God by saying, please help, it opens the way. It opens the possibilities for us. So surrender, the second part of this prayer of help, is, really starts with help, right? It's the first step in surrender. When we ask help, we open ourselves up. We give over. That's what surrender is in spiritual terms. It's not giving up, but giving over. And so we give over to the greatness, to the allness, to the possibilities, to the mundane, to the earthy answers, to the people around us, to the things we can't even imagine the ways that the help might show up. We just give it over. We just ask and give it over. You know, all the mystics talk about surrender. St. Teresa of Avila in her mystical masterpiece, The Interior Castle, has a one-word sentence, surrender, period, space. <laughs> because it's the essence that giving over is the, is the faith walk, isn't it? And so we can begin with help, and that opens the way. Help, I need help. I need something, I need to call upon the allness of God, something bigger than me, the source of God, the source of, of all, the source of me. And then the answers will rush in in various ways if we just stay open. It's a lot easier to receive the help if we stay empty-handed, you know, if we stay open, ready to receive. How many of us give it over and then take it back? Give it over and then take it back. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to turn that problem over to God. Well, but what if I did this? Or what if I did, well, I'll just do this and that and A, B, and C, and then we'll see what happens. You know, and so it is instead of, of that wanting and grasping for control once again to just turn it over. And if we have to, turn it over again. Because the answers will and do come. The pause might be longer than we want it to be. Because most of us want immediate answers, right? But that long pause, not to be afraid of that long pause, right? to stay with it, to allow it to be in that hallway of uncertainty. It's oh so hard for us humans to do this, isn't it? And yet, when we do it, haven't you seen how it works for you when you wait for the right thing, when you allow yourself to just wait empty-handed, open-minded, open-hearted for the answers to come? And in they come, in their own time. Karen Taylor Good, the New Thought musician, sings, I don't always get what I want, but I get what I need. And so sometimes it, it doesn't come exactly as we would like it in the exact package that we think it should come. But often we get something better, something that we need in a whole new way. So I had walked into the serenity room, which was a little room at the convention where you could go and get a chair massage or other kinds of energy practice practitioners were there. And um, I, I was just wanting a chair massage and I had 30 minutes and, and I walked in and nobody was there except for this woman who was standing next to a gravity chair with a big screen with funky sort of meditative colorful images on it and a, a computer. And so we were talking about the chair massage and she was trying to tell me where I could go to find the chair massage therapist. And I said, well, what do you do? And she started to explain this brain health kind of program that she runs. And I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. Why don't I try that? Because, you know, because what I really recognized and what I'm getting better at every day, um, that is an affirmation, is, is being present to what is right now, what is right in front of me right now. You know, what is here and available? Who is here in front of me right now? You know, a lot of times going to the convention, it's like a big part of it is also, you know, reconnecting with old friends. But instead of being in that position of, you know, looking for my old friends, this time I just 
was with whoever was in front of me. And so I ended up meeting new people or even inviting new people to meals that I wanted to get to know, just to be, to be present to what was in the moment. And then great things unfold when we do that. It's so simple, really. And I can't think we do that with prayers, right? We're kind of you know, looking for the, the thing that we think we need and we miss what's right in front of us. You know, the answer that's right in front of us, the gift that's right in front of us, the person that's right in front of us. And so if we just slow down and be present to what is, the help is there. The answers are there. The solutions are right here. So I ended up doing this, this brain, I forgot what it was even called, brain neuropathy kind of thing. And um, after I finished, she said, now tonight you might either have really restful sleep, should have told me this before, or crazy dreams. And so I had crazy dreams. <laughs> and um, interestingly enough, my crazy dreams were about all kinds of bodily release. So it was kind of a gross dream, if you will. <laughs> but I thought, well, how interesting then that the next day I walk into the bathroom and somebody is needing help who's having a bodily release problem. You know, God could not make this stuff up any better. <laughs> So it's like, lest you forget about your dream and this process, let me have you, give you a real life example and get to be on the other side of it, right? To get to be not the one seeking the help, but the one helping. So it also made me realize that I am on both sides of the situation I was holding while I was doing this brain work and releasing stress and concern and worry, which are the kind of the lower levels that show up in this work. Apparently the lower levels show up for a while and you retrain your brain when the music skips to come back into alignment, to come back into alignment. So eventually your brain is clearer and, and permanently trained to better clarity and better focus. Sounds like a good program to me, huh? 30, 30 minutes or less now, you have to do multiple sessions, but. <laughs> so, what's that? Don't. Don't, yeah, right. <laughs> it's a good start though. But you know, it was, it was that recognition, that recognition that, that things show up for us in these ways and, and that there, it, it's always present for us. There's always a, an answer to that help, whether it comes it, in whatever order it comes to us. So, so this connection is really key, that, that, our, that we're connected to one another. And so my connection to this woman was a great gift to me, to be able to help someone that just feels good right in, right in and of itself. But then there was more to it because it was really echoing something I was working with. And so she came up to me the next day profusely, you know, expressing her gratitude and how she's not good at asking for help. And she just didn't think to just yell out to somebody in the bathroom, but she was so grateful that I offered her help and so on. And I was like, oh, geez, no worries. It was no big deal at all, you know? And, and we just parted. And a few minutes later, I was like, you know what? It was a big deal. So I ran after her, you know? And I said, you know what? Actually, it was a big deal. And I'll tell you why it was a big deal, because I also was having all these dreams and I was working through something. And so it gave me this opportunity. And so because I wanted her to know that that it wasn't an isolated incident of her needing help and someone coming to her aid, because it never is. It never is. We are not, we do not operate in this world in isolation. We forget that so often, I think. That's why we don't ask for help, right? Because we think, well, I can do it. I'll do it by myself. I'll figure it out. Why? When you have all these people who would love to help you and it would help them to help you. See, we never know. We never, we don't always know how we can help, how we've helped somebody unless they tell us or somehow it comes back around to us, but it doesn't really matter. We can just know in our hearts that we are indeed somebody, some something at any given time. You know, when we give up our seat on BART or we're the one who comes along with the boat or on the side of the road, or when we help somebody with their groceries or we say a kind word or give a hug or smile, you know, it's just simple things can be an answer to somebody's prayer, a profound effect on somebody's life. So our prayers are not one way. They're not a, 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 the, we as a lowly human praying to the, the greatness of God. It is, it is we in this process together with the, the activity and the, the as-ness of God that we are that and everyone around us is that too. So don't confuse 
you know, the lowly experiences, the mundane experiences of life with the transcendent miracles because they're all one and the same. And a call of prayer, a call of help is what initiates those possibilities all coming together in this interconnected web. So what do you need help with in your life right now? Is there something you need help with in your life right now? I would encourage you to pray the prayer, help. And then just turn it over. And then just let it go. And then just allow whatever wants to come through in this beautiful, amazing, interconnected world to happen. Don't get in the way of it. Don't try to pull it back. Just sit in the openness with open hands and open mind and open heart and see what could come, what we could possibly experience that we might cut off if we cut it off too soon. So I encourage us to just pray the prayer of help this week and see the miracles that will abound. Let's know this together in this affirmation. Together, I pray help and some something delivers what I need and so much more. And so it is. Thank you.